Hey students, so today in this lecture, we'll discuss ScrewJack. So ScrewJack is basically one of the applications. It is a device which works on the application of the friction. So whenever we hear the term ScrewJack, one thing comes uh, into our mind straightforward is the jack that we use to lift the car. Whenever we have to change the tires of the car, we use the screw jack to lift the car, okay? So we can see that the car has a very high load, okay? It is it has a very high weight, and that load of the car is lifted with the help of a very small effort, okay? Relatively small effort, okay? Therefore, we can see that this screw jack is a simple machine or a device that is used to lift heavy loads with relatively small effort, okay? It works on the principle of screw and nut. We'll see the construction soon. That is, it contains a screw and a nut. So again, one thing we have observed that the input motion that we give to the screw jack is a rotation, okay? The screw jack consists of a, a lever, okay, which is attached to the screw. We can see here in the schematic. Okay, you can see that and this is the screw. Okay, this is the screw. We can see that there are threads on the screw. And this is the head of the screw. Okay, this is the head of the screw. And this is the body of the screw, which we call as the shank as well. And you can see that there are threads on the screw. There is also a lever arm to which we are giving some uh, effort. Okay, to which we are giving some effort. This has been shown as the load, which is to be raised. Okay, so you can see that there is a lever connected here. This P is actually in the direction which is perpendicular to the plane of the paper, either inwards or outwards, okay? We can see that the rotation is given. We give some effort to the lever P, either into the plane of the paper or out of the plane of the paper. And correspondingly, there will be some rotation of this lever. This is the input motion. That is, we are giving the rotary motion to this lever. Okay, we are giving the rotary motion. We are applying an effort on the lever which converts the, it into the rotary motion of the screw. Okay, therefore, this is the input motion, or we can say that we are applying a torque or the moment which has been shown in this schematic. Okay, you can see that when this there has been an anti clockwise moment applied. This is the input motion, and this input motion gets converted into the translate translatory motion of the screw. Okay, it gets converted into the translatory motion of the screw. Therefore, the output which you are getting is the, the output motion is the translation of the screw in the vertical direction. Obviously, it will be in the vertical direction and this uh, motion of the screw in the vertical direction can either raise the load or it can lower the load, okay? If the screw is moving upwards, obviously it will raise the load and it is if it is moving downwards, it will lower the load, okay? So this is simple introduction of the screw jack. That is, it is a simple machine, which is used to lift loads with relatively small efforts, okay? And the input motion is the rotary motion. We apply an effort to the lever, which gets converted into the rotary motion, or we can say that we are applying a torque as the input and we are getting the translatory motion as the output, which lifts or lowers the load, okay? So let's see in detail some of the parts of the screw. What is the screw composed of? Screw jack composed of, okay? So let's see one schematic here. Okay, what are the basic parts here? So we can see that we have, this is the head of the screw. Okay, and this is the main body of the screw. This is the main body of the screw and there are threads on the screw. These are the threads. The threads which are usually used in the screw jack are square threads. We have various different kinds of the thread profiles which the students are usually uh, studying in the CAD course, okay? Like may thread, square thread, V threads, but in mostly in the power transmission, we use these square threads, okay? So their cross section is a square. So this is the head of the screw and this is the body of the screw. And here, this is the weight or the load which is needed to be lifted, okay? It's the weight of the load which is needed to be lifted. These 
this these are the threads and one more component here is the nut okay obviously the nuts will contain the internal threads okay which mesh with these external threads of this screw okay you can see that on this screw there are external threads and this nut will carry the internal threads okay there will be internal threads which will mesh with the external threads of the screw and this is the stand this is the stand okay so in our analysis we are assuming that let me define first the time meters you can see that this is one extreme portion of the thread this is another extreme portion of the thread the distance between these two will be the outer diameter okay this will be the outer diameter d naught d o it is the outer diameter Outer diameter of the screw, or sometimes it is also known as the nominal diameter. Okay, this is the nominal diameter. Now, if we look at this portion here, see the distance between this distance, this is known as the internal diameter of the thread. internal diameter or it is also known as the core diameter okay and correspondingly we will have the outer radius that will be equal to d naught by 2 and inner radius that will be equal to di by 2 okay and we define a term that is known as the mean diameter on effective diameter of the thread. DM or sometimes it is simply represented by D. It is the mean diameter. Therefore, it will be the, the geometric mean of this internal and external diameter. And similarly, we will have the mean radius. Okay. Similarly, we'll have the mean radius represented by small r that will be equal to mean diameter by two okay this is the mean diameter mean diameter or effective diameter and this is the mean radius so these are the various uh, some uh, uh, geometrical parameters of this uh, thread okay internal diameter external diameter and this mean diameter and we usually assume that see here we have to apply some effort to this uh, screw jack and usually it is applied in our analysis okay although we have a lever as well but in our analysis for some time we'll assume that it is applied at the lever arm of radius okay mean radius in fact okay it is applied at the lever arm of the mean radius that is the force arm will be equal to the mean radius this okay therefore this effort which is applied here either into the plane or out of the plane of the paper this effort will create a moment that moment will be equal to this moment will be equal to p into r okay p is the effort and r is the lever arm which is equal to the mean radius although we have a lever as well okay which is uh, uh, which we had seen here in the schematic here we have a lever this lever will actually create a moment of p into l okay but for current for time being we will assume that we are applying this moment at the distance of r okay at the distance of mean radius from the axis of the screw you can see that this is the axis of the screw okay this is the axis of the screw one more thing that we need to define here is the pitch of the screw okay pitch of the screw let me consider one point on the screw that is suppose i consider one point here and i will have another corresponding point on another thread okay this is point number one which is on one thread and the corresponding point is the point number two which is on the another thread the distance between these two points is known as the pitch of the screw okay this is the pitch of the screw and it is denoted by small p okay it is denoted by small p to differentiate it from the external effort that is represented by the capital p okay one more thing is that 
let's first of all define the pitch here. The pitch is defined as it is the distance between one point on thread to the corresponding point on another thread okay so this is the pitch of the screw one more definition is that what is the lead of the screw okay what is the lead of the screw now we can see that we have uh, given the input motion as the torque okay our torque is the input motion or the rotary motion and how much it moves okay how much the screw moves vertically upwards or downwards when we are applying one revolution okay when we are applying the one revolution see here we are giving the torque and this will cause the rotary motion in one revolution okay that is when the angle traversed is equal to 2 pi okay in, in one revolution the lever will turn around by uh, this 2 pi okay by the angle of 2 pi so in one revolution what is the vertical distance traveled by the screw that will be the lead of the pitch sorry the lead of the screw okay so we can see that another definition is that lead of the screw lead is the actual distance okay it is the actual distance because it is along the axis of the screw lead is the actual distance traveled by the screw during one revolution okay so it is the actual distance traveled by the screw during the one revolution So we have defined it a couple of terms that is pitch and the lead okay there is a relationship between the lead and the pitch we can write this relation here the lead of a screw is equal to n times the pitch of the screw where this parameter n depends n can have a value of one two or three see here we have three types of starts okay we usually have three types of starts one is a single start thread and for the single start thread this value is equal to one therefore in the single start thread the lead is equal to the pitch but if we are having a multi start thread suppose we are having a double start thread this value of n is equal to 2 that is the lead will be equal to twice the pitch and if we are having a, tipple, a triple start thread or three start thread sometimes we say it this value of n will be equal to 3 and the lead will be equal to 3 times the pitch okay so usually we have seen that sometimes it is directly written that the while we are giving one revolution the screw will advance okay it will travel in the vertical direction by a distance that is equal to the pitch of the screw but that is true only for a single start thread okay therefore we have to completely define whether the thread is of single start double start or triple start okay usually we study this single start thread therefore we usually directly say that lead is equal to the pitch of the screw but it is only uh, true for the when we have a value of n equal to one that is for a single start thread but if we are having a double start thread then lead will be equal to the twice of the pitch okay let's see one of the schematic schematic where we can see this uh, various starts of the thread okay see here this was the single start thread okay 
this is the complete thread. This is the two star thread. Okay, see there, this is the blue. Uh, this blue thread is a single thread. Okay, you can see that this blue thread is a single thread. And it's going like this. And in between this thread here, we have another thread, which is of the silver color. Okay, so this is one thread here, and this is a second thread here. So in this case, we say that, that this is a two star thread here. And from the schematic, it has been written that this lead is equal to the twice of the pitch. Okay, this lead is equal to the twice of the pitch. The distance between these two threads is equal to the pitch, but the lead will be equal to twice the pitch. So similarly here, in this case, we have thread number one. This is thread number two. And this is the third thread. Okay, so if this is the first thread here, then this is again this first thread. But in between this first thread, there are two more threads, okay? This shown by the light blue color and third shown by the silver color, okay? So in this case, the distance between the two threads will be the pitch, but the lead will be equal to three, uh, three times the pitch, okay? Thrice the pitch. So this is the uh, representation of these uh, threads, okay? Based upon the start, okay? So for the single start thread, I can say that lead is equal to the pitch. For this double start or two start thread, I can say that lead is equal to the twice of the pitch. And for here, the lead is equal to thrice of the pitch. Okay. So these are the some basic uh, terms that are associated with the screw. Okay. We have seen what is the inner diameter that is the uh, smallest diameter or the core diameter. We have seen what is the outer diameter that is the largest diameter and it is also known as the nominal diameter. And we have defined it the pitch and the lead of the screw, okay? So see here now again. What is the basic principle? It just works on the inclined plane, okay? It works on the inclined plane. So this is the body of the screw and here one thread has been shown here okay you can see that oh, there is a one thread which is wrapped around the screw okay so if we develop this okay if we stretch it so see here if we hold one point here point a point b okay one end of the screw has been shown here and another end okay these are the extreme ends so if we are holding this a and we are stretching it okay we are unwinding this screw or we can say that we are unwrapping the screw. If we unwind it or unwrap it, okay, we will get this wedge here, okay? We can see that we will get a wedge here. Okay, so what is the importance of this wedge see here? We are just modeling the motion of this load. See here, this is the load applied, okay? This is the load applied on the screw some portions of the screw are not in contact with the nut you can see that this portion of the screw is not in contact with the nut this portion here below is also not in contact with the nut this middle portion here these are the threads which are in contact with the nut here okay and the load will be carried by this portion of the threads okay the load will be carried by this portion of the threads okay so these threads here which are in contact with the nut these are completely responsible for carrying this load Okay, these are completely responsible for carrying this load. Now, if we take an example of the raising of the load, okay, if we take an example of the raising of the load, then it can be seen that this raising of the load is equivalent to, this raising of the load is equivalent to the motion of the load on this plane, on this inclined plane, okay? This inclined plane in the front view can be seen as a rectangle, this triangle, a right angular triangle. Okay, actually it is a wedge, but in the front view, we can see that this is a right angular triangle and this angle is known as the alpha, which is the helix angle. Okay, this angle is known as the alpha or helix angle. Okay, it is the helix angle denoted by alpha. So see here, when we are unwrapping this thread, we are unwrapping this thread or unwinding this thread, this distance will be equal to the circumference. Okay, it will be equal to the circumference. You can see that this is equal to the circumference. Hold the point A and stretch this thread and we will have an extreme end of the B here, okay? And this distance will be equal to the circumference which is also denoted by pi D. And 
if we are saying that this is a single start thread, then this vertical distance, okay, this height of the wedge will be equal to the lead or it will be equal to the pitch if this is a single start thread, okay? So this distance is the lead. Therefore, I can show here, after unwrapping this thread, this is equal to the pi d, and this will be equal to lead. And this lead will be equal to the pitch if it is a case of a single start thread, okay? So when this load is being raised, therefore, it can be modeled that it is modeled that this load is moving on the inclined plane. Okay, when we are raising the load, okay, it is assumed that it is just similar to the motion of the load on this helix. Okay, the raising of the load, raising of load is equivalent to. the motion of the load on upper surface of the thread. Therefore, when the load is being raised, it is. it seems that the load is moving on the upper surface of this thread, okay? Therefore, we can model this, okay? We can model this situation into a situation where we can assume that after unwrapping or unwinding of this thread, the motion of the raising or lowering of the load is equivalent to the motion of a block of the same weight, okay? If there is a weight which is acting here, W, therefore, it is equivalent to the raising or the raising of this block of the same weight w on an inclined plane okay on an inclined plane so what we have done we have just simply modeled this is known as the modeling okay modeling we have just modeled this motion of the load okay raising or lowering of the load this we have modeled it into the uh, motion of the block of the same weight okay if this is the weight w here we, we have again the weight w as if it is moving on this inclined plane okay so this is clear that if the load is being raised it is equivalent to the motion of this load okay it is as if the load is being traveling on the upper surface of this thread therefore we just unwind or unwrap this thread which will be in the form of a wedge whose dimension will be equal to the circumference and the other dimension will be equal to the lead. And this motion can be approximated or it can be modeled that it is a block which is moving on the inclined plane. Okay, it is moving on the inclined plane. So mu will be the coefficient of friction. If mu is the coefficient of friction between screw and nut, okay. So now, instead of focusing our attention on this motion of the screw, we can focus all our attention on the motion of this block on an inclined plane, okay. Motion of this block on an inclined plane. One more important thing is that we have to raise the load. Let's consider the case of raising the load. Now, how is this effort applied, okay? Here we are seeing that we are applying an effort. This is an effort P, which is to be applied, okay? This is an effort P, which is to be applied. Now, see here, in this case, this effort is applied perpendicular to the plane, okay? I had discussed it in the initial slide here that this P is the load which is applied perpendicular to the plane. So now how can we show this effort on this block, okay? So commonly students make this mistake that they are showing the effort in this direction. But this will be wrong, okay? How this is wrong, we can see here. <clears throat> see here, the load was applied. This load was applied perpendicular to the plane. It was applied perpendicular to this plane of the paper. Okay, that is into the, if this is X direction, if this is Y direction, the load was applied in the Z direction. Okay, so actually this load is applied in the Z direction. 
and when we are unwrapping this thread that is when we are unwrapping this thread the same load will be shown in this direction okay the same load will be shown in this direction so this is actually the horizontal direction the load is being applied in the horizontal direction so we have to show the application of the load when we are raising the load the direction of the effort when we are raising the load up the inclined plane will be shown in this direction okay not in the inclined direction so this thing has to be clear because we had applied the force perpendicular to the plane okay and when we are unwrapping this thread or unwinding this thread this load will be shown in this direction okay so now this problem has been modeled to a load which is being raised on an inclined plane okay which is to be raised on an inclined plane by an effort which is applied perpendicular to the motion of the load okay perpendicular to the motion so what we had seen that after we had unwrapped or unwinded the thread we got a wedge whose front view is a right angle triangle and this alpha is known as the helix angle so how is this helix angle defined this helix angle is the angle made by the helix of the thread with a plane perpendicular to the axis of the screw okay so if this is the axis of the screw if we consider a plane which is perpendicular to the axis of the screw then the angle made by this screw with that plane will be known as the alpha okay this is the helix angle and we had also seen that this distance is equal to pi d that is the circumference and this distance is equal to the lead so from this trigonometric ratio here we can say that tan alpha is equal to base by hypotenuse that is equal to lead divided by circumference so from here we will get the value of the helix angle that is alpha is equal to tan inverse l by pi d okay so this is the formula for the helix angle it is equal to the lead divided by tan inverse of the lead by pi d and if this is a single start thread then this lead will be equal to the pitch okay but only for single start okay so this is the helix angle okay so what we have seen here is that the screw can be considered as an inclined plane with an inclination of alpha okay it is considered as an inclined plane with an inclination of the alpha okay now we have to see what is the effort required to raise the load okay that is actually we have to find the value of the p okay this is the effort which is required to raise the load okay we can show it here the effort p which we have to apply to raise this load on an inclined plane or we can say that to raise the load with the help of the screw jack so this will be since we had modeled it to a block which is being 
moving on an inclined plane okay moving on an inclined plane which has a helix angle of alpha and the load the effort which we have to find out is this p this is the p which we have to find out how much is it is to be applied to raise the load okay to raise the load we can again see that this p can be resolved into two components okay so if this is alpha this again will be equal to alpha okay this again will be equal to alpha and this will be the cost component this component here which is being shown with this red color is the sine component of this alpha okay this is the sine component of the alpha after that what is this uh, load which has been shown with the blue color it is actually the normal reaction this is the normal reaction which the inclined plane will exert on this block that is it will be perpendicular to the block one more force that has been shown with the green color that is the weight of this block and it is actually the load which has to be raised and we know that this will be the sine component and this component again shown with the green color here is the cost component now since this block is trying to move in the upward direction therefore we will have a friction force that is acting in the downward direction so this is the friction force which is acting in the downward direction so this is the complete fpt of this block when we are trying to raise the load okay now we can apply the equilibrium equations in the direction of the plane okay along the plane and perpendicular to the plane so along the plane the summation of the forces should be equal to zero okay what are the forces along the plane we can see that p cos alpha is up the plane okay this p cos alpha is up the plane w sine alpha is down the plane therefore opposite sign and minus friction force it is again down the plane therefore this has to be equal to zero okay now see here one more thing is that the friction force we are we will consider the limiting condition okay we will consider the limiting condition that is the what is the effort just required to raise the load okay limiting condition so just to raise the load if we are saying that what is the effort applied just to raise the load then in that case the friction should be equal to the mu times normal reaction okay this friction force will have the limiting value that is coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal reaction therefore we can write here again that is this will be equal to p cos alpha minus w sin alpha minus mu n that should be equal to zero so this is the first equation the second equation can be obtained by applying the equilibrium condition along this perpendicular to the plane okay in this case we will be applying the equilibrium equation perpendicular to the plane perpendicular to the plane summation of the forces should again be equal to zero therefore what are the forces that are perpendicular to the plane we can see that the forces are here the normal reaction is in the upward direction and this cost component of the weight is in the downward direction okay perpendicular to the plane minus the sine component of the applied effort that is again in the downward direction so this has to be equal to zero from here we get that normal reaction should be equal to w cos alpha plus p sin alpha so we can substitute this substitute the second equation in first okay we will put the value of the normal reaction in this equation here then we will get that p cos alpha minus w sin alpha and we had minus mu n okay in place of mu n in place of n we will write w cos alpha plus p sin alpha
this has to be equal to zero. So since we are interested in finding the value of the P, therefore taking out the P terms from one side, therefore P in brackets, we will have cos alpha. And here we will have mu sine alpha minus mu. Minus mu sine alpha, okay? And the terms of the weight, that is this minus W in brackets, we will have sine alpha. And we have minus mu cos alpha, so we can write it here because minus we have taken outside. So here it will be mu cos alpha. So this again should be equal to zero. So from here, we can see that after rearrangement, this will be equal to W sine alpha plus mu cos alpha divided by cos alpha minus mu sine alpha. Okay. So from here, we can take this uh, cos alpha term common. We will have in a bracket sine alpha by cos alpha that will be equal to tan alpha plus this mu. Okay. In this place of mu, this is the coefficient of friction. And we know the relation that mu is equal to tan phi, where phi is the friction angle. Okay, it is the friction angle and it is also equal to the angle of repose at the impending motion. Okay, we had seen in the, in the uh, friction lecture. Therefore, this tan, this mu will be replaced by tan phi and cos alpha we have taken out. Okay, it will be in brackets, we can write it one. And in the denominator, what we have done here is we have also taken, we can take out the cos alpha as common. So we will be left with one minus in place of mu, we will write tan phi, that is the tangent of the friction angle. And in place of sine alpha will be divided by cos alpha, that will be equal to tan alpha, okay? So cos alpha and cos alpha will cancel out and we will be left with P is equal to W tan alpha plus tan phi divided by one minus tan phi tan alpha. Okay, one more thing students can note here is that in the book, alpha is represented by theta. Okay, in our book, which are fo we are following, that is the RC Hibbler text, the alpha, that is the helix angle has been written by, is denoted by theta. Okay, so to add the confusion, we must know that and the alpha, which I'm writing here is actually the theta, which has been written in the uh, RC Hibbler text, okay? So this is a formula, okay? So this is a formula, a trigonometric formula, well-known trigonometric formula that tan alpha plus tan phi divided by one minus tan phi tan alpha, it is equal to, this will be equal to, P is equal to W tan of phi plus alpha. Okay, so finally we have arrived the, at the equation. Effort required to raise the load. Okay, so this is the equation of the effort required to raise the load. And you can see that it depends upon the what load is to be raised, okay? And it is also dependent upon the helix angle and the friction angle. Okay, we can see that it is dependent upon the helix angle and the friction angle. So sometimes it is asked that what is the moment required to raise the load? Okay, so this moment depends upon the lever arm as well. Okay, so if you remember in my uh, just few minutes back, I had assumed that I am applying a force at a distance of mean radius from the axis, that is at the distance of r from the axis then this P can be replaced by, okay, this P can be replaced by moment by R, okay, moment is equal to the load into the force arm, that the lever arm here is equal to R because I'm applying the force or the effort at a distance of R from the axis of the screw. Therefore, P is equal to moment by R 
therefore this equation in terms of the moment required or the torque required to raise the load that becomes okay this p can be replaced by moment by r r will go towards the right hand side because from the left hand side it was in the denominator and when i move it into the right hand side it will go into the multiplication therefore the equation will look like this okay for the moment required or the torque required to raise the load this is actually the torque required to raise the load okay so this is the torque required to raise the load now we have to see what is the effort required to lower the load so one thing will come into our mind that and the effort required to raise the load will be equal to the effort required to lower the load but it's not the case because if you have observed while we are lifting up the car when we are using the screw jack to change the tires we apply a large effort compared to the effort that we are applied that we have to apply when we are lowering the car okay you might have experienced experienced this thing that while lifting the car we are applying much effort and while we are lowering the car the effort required is comparatively less than that of the effort required to raise the load or raise the car in that case therefore for that thing we again need to calculate that effort and for that the free body diagram will change this is the free body diagram when we are studying the effort required to lower the load now while we were applying the effort to raise the load the direction of the force was shown towards the positive x axis okay if i consider this system to be the this to be our coordinate coordinate system x and y in the previous case when we are trying to raise the load the effort was applied in the horizontal direction but towards the positive x axis but here the effort has to be in the opposite direction obviously when we are applying the effort in one direction suppose we are applying the effort it was going in the clockwise direction it would have raised the load but when we have to lower the load my torque should be in the anti clockwise direction obviously then i need to i need to change the direction of my effort that is p should be opposite in this case okay and obviously it can be seen that if we see the previous free body diagram see this red colored force was the effort required to raise the load its component is along the plane and upwards because i have to raise the load okay obviously it will have a component which will be along the plane and upwards now since here i have to lower the load this will be the direction of the p and obviously it will have a component which will try to lower the load down the plane okay i have to move down the plane so we can see that if uh, since this is an helix angle alpha so this will be the alpha this component will be the cos component that is p cos alpha and this component shown here with the red color will be the sine component that is p sin alpha okay again we can see here this w color for this w color arrow is shown for the weight of the block that is w and this will be the cos component w cos alpha and this green color component here will be w sin alpha okay so this is another force the force which has been shown here with the blue color is the normal reaction and the force which has been shown with this brown color here is actually the frictional force so in this case the block is moving downwards therefore the friction force should act upwards again we have to use the equilibrium equation summation of the forces should be zero along the plane and if the summation of forces is zero along the plane the forces in the in that direction are f is along the plane and in the upward direction whereas p cos alpha and w sin alpha are in the opposite direction they have to be shown with the negative sign so this is w sin alpha minus p cos alpha that should be equal to zero and again i am considering the limiting condition therefore this friction force should be written 
and this value should be equal to mu n because I'm considering the limiting condition where the effort just required to lower the load. So this will be equal to W sine alpha minus B cos alpha. So this should be equal to zero. Okay, so this is the first equation. Now the second equilibrium equation will be summation of the forces is equal to zero perpendicular to the plane. The forces which are perpendicular to the plane are the normal direction. It is in the upward direction plus P sine alpha is again in the upward direction minus W cos alpha, it is in the downward direction. This should be equal to zero. So from here, we can calculate that normal direction is equal to W cos alpha minus P sine alpha. So substituting this normal reaction here in the first equation, after substituting it in the first equation, we get that mu normal reaction capability, we can write that it is equal to W cos alpha minus P sine alpha and mu n minus W sine alpha now minus P cos alpha this should be equal to zero, okay? So again, we are interested in finding out this effort which is required to lower the load. Therefore, I am interested in finding out the value of the P. Therefore, I can have minus mu P sine alpha. And here I have minus P cos alpha. And we are left with plus mu w cos alpha and minus mu sorry w sin alpha this has to be equal to zero okay so i can take this terms of the p in one towards the right i will get that p cos alpha p cos alpha plus mu p sin alpha This should be equal to mu w cos alpha minus w sine alpha. So p can be taken as common. And after taking p as common, I will be left in with the brackets with uh, cos alpha plus mu sine alpha that can be taken into the denominator from the right hand side. Therefore, I, I will have mu w cos alpha minus w sine alpha divided by cos alpha plus mu sine alpha. So again, we can take cos alpha to be common. So when cos alpha is taken as common in the brackets, we'll be left with mu w minus okay we can take w as well as common so therefore no need to write w here we'll be left with a mu here and minus sine alpha by cos alpha that will be equal to tan alpha and here in the denominator we will have we can again take cos alpha to be common we will be left with one plus mu sine alpha by cos alpha that will be equal to tan alpha okay so this p will be equal to now cos alpha and cos alpha will cancel we will have w and in place of mu we can write again it is the tan of the friction angle minus tan of alpha divided by one plus mu in place of mu i can again write the friction angle that is tan alpha tan phi plus tan alpha okay again this formula is a well-known trigonometric formula that is equal to tan of phi minus alpha it is equal to tan of phi minus alpha okay so this is the effort required to lower the load
this is the effort which is required to lower the load. And if you compare it with the effort required to raise the load, we had W tan, W tan of phi plus alpha. And here we have W tan phi minus alpha. So obviously uh, the uh, effort required to raise the load will be greater than the effort required to lower the load, okay? So because that has phi plus alpha and here we have phi minus alpha. So similarly, if we want to find out what is the torque required to raise the load or lower the load here. So if we want to find out the torque, then P will be replaced by moment by R that is equal to W tan of phi minus alpha and moment will be equal to WR tan of phi minus alpha. So this is the moment required to lower the load or torque required to lower the load. This is the torque required to lower the load. So one important application of this equation is that, now if I'm writing that force required to lower the load, I'm again writing the equation of the force required to lower the load. So if I say that, first condition, if phi is greater than alpha, that is friction angle is greater than helix angle. If the friction angle is greater than helix angle, what we will have, we will have tan of phi minus alpha, that will be positive. And when this quantity is positive, we will say that the load, the effort which is required to lower the load, that will be positive. So such a condition is called the self-locking condition. This condition is known as the self-locking condition. That is, some effort is required to lower the load. Now, assume that if we are uh, raising a car, okay, we have to change the tires of the car, we have to uh, raise the car. Now, when we are applying some uh, turns to the lever, we are applying some revolutions to the lever. Now we have taken the car to a desired height so that we are able to change the uh, tires of the car. Now we don't uh, keep the effort continuously. After we have raised the car to some certain height, we just remove the load, okay? We just remove the effort. Once we have raised the car to a desired height, we just remove the effort. But the car doesn't fall on removing the effort, okay? Car does not fall on removing the effort. Therefore, the car does not fall on removing the effort is because there is some effort required to lower the car. Therefore, we have to apply some effort in the opposite direction to lower the car. That is P is positive. P is positive means that some effort is required to lower the load. Okay, some effort is required to lower the load. Okay, so when we are moving the car upwards, when we have, uh, uh, when we have raised the car to some desired height, we just leave the lever arm of the screw. The car will remain in that intact position. It won't fall down. Therefore, we say that the car, the condition is a self-locking. Okay, once we have removed our effort, the car will be in that position and it will get locked. Therefore, it will be the self-locking screw. But see here, if there is a second condition, if phi is less than alpha, that is friction angle is less than helix angle. If friction angle is less than helix angle, then tan of phi minus alpha, since phi is less than alpha, this quantity will be negative. That is the effort required to lower the car will be negative. What does this mean? Effort required to lower the car will be negative. It means that no force is required to lower the car. Okay, it means that no force is required to lower the load.
if no force is required to lower the load just uh, if we are moving the, the car upwards okay if we are raising the load that is we are moving the car upwards after some time we have uh, uh, raised the car to certain height if we release the force now okay if we remove the effort the car will automatically fall down which we don't want okay because in that case there will be no effort to lower the car okay there will be no effort to, required to lower the car and that condition is known as the overhauling condition this condition is known as overhauling condition and this is undesirable okay obviously we don't want it okay so there are two conditions based upon which angle is greater okay uh, compare comparison of the friction angle with the helix angle so if friction angle is greater than the helix angle then the condition is of the self logging that is some effort will be required to lower the load okay so the condition of the self logging is that phi is greater than alpha and we know that phi is equal to tan of the coefficient of friction and this helix angle is equal to tan of lead by pi d so this mu should be greater than lead of the screw divided by pi d okay okay so these both are the conditions of self locking okay these are the conditions of the self locking okay so what we have done we have found out the equations to equations of the effort required to raise the load and lower the load okay so now we are going in a position to find out the efficiency of the screw jack Okay, so efficiency is always defined as some output divided by some input. Okay, we are getting some input and what is the output that we are getting? That is the efficiency of any device, okay? Leave with the screw jack. It is the efficiency of any device. But with respect to our application of the screw jack, this efficiency will be, what is the output? So see here we are, the input is the, torque okay we are applying some input in the form of the torque we are giving the torque as the input and we are getting the raising of the load as the output okay so we are giving some work in the form of the torque okay we are applying some effort and the lever is uh, rotating by some angle that is we are giving some work input and we are also getting some work output the work output is the raising or loading of the load let's consider the raising of the load so our output here is work done in raising the load okay and the input is work done okay work done by torque okay we can say that work done by input torque because our this uh, uh, because our output is that we want our uh, we want the load to get raised or lowered okay let's take the case of raising the load therefore uh, we say that the efficiency is equal to work done in raising the load divided by the input work the input work is the uh, we are giving the input in the form of a torque and what is the work done by the torque that has to be calculated so that we are able to calculate the work done by the input torque okay fine so we are giving so many revolutions and based upon the revolutions and the load will be raised or lowered okay consider the raising of the load therefore we won't be able to calculate the efficiency on the basis of so many revolutions okay we'll be able to calculate but let's calculate it for the per revolution case 
that is work done in the raising of the load per revolution divided by work done by the input torque per revolution okay if we are ca calculating it for one revolution obviously it will be same for all the revolutions we have applied in raising the load okay therefore we will calculate it on the basis of the per revolution okay so what will be the output work output is that load is raised therefore work will be work per revolution will be load multiplied by distance traveled by the load in the one revolution okay output is that load is being raised that is work has been done on the load and how much work is we are obtaining okay how much work we are obtaining we, that is equal to the load times the distance traveled by the load in one revolution okay so therefore we can say that work output is equal to work output will be equal to load is w that is this is the load which you have to raise or lower consider the raising of the load in this case and the distance traveled by the load in one revolution that will be equal to lead okay we have defined it okay lead is the distance traveled by uh, uh, the load in one revolution of the lever so this is the output work now what about the input work input work is we are torque to lever okay torque to lever we are giving the torque to the lever then work will be equal to the torque that we are giving to the lever and what is the angle traversed by the lever okay what is the angle traversed by the lever okay so what is the angle traversed by the lever so torque kitna hum dete hain torque is equal to effort multiplied by your arm so in my analysis i had assumed that i am giving the effort is applied at a distance of r okay at the distance of mean right is therefore this will be equal to pr or this will be equal to pd by 2 this is the torque and what is theta theta is equal to in one revolution theta will be equal to 2 pi so therefore and this equation will be the work output will be equal to torque is equal to pd by 2 and this is equal to 2 pi therefore work output will be equal to 2 and 2 will cancel it will be equal to pi pd okay this will be equal to pi pd so we can see that efficiency is equal to that is meter it is equal to the output work the output work is w into l okay it is equal to w into l and the input work is pi pt efficiency of the screw jack will be output work that is equal to w into l divided by pi pd where p is the uh, effort required to lower or raise the load so we can see that here we can see that this is w this is p which is the effort required to lower or raise the load okay don't confuse it with pitch pitch is represented by small p and this is the capital p there is a term that is we can take this term here l by pi d and we had defined it this is the tan of the helix angle okay in the initial slides we had seen that l by pi d is the tangent of the helix angle therefore we can write the efficiency to be efficiency will be equal to w and p p is the effort required to raise the load that is equal to w of tan of 5 plus alpha 
okay this is tan of phi plus alpha and since this is equal to the tan of alpha therefore we can write tan of alpha this will be the formula for the efficiency of the screw jack okay in fact we can uh, solve it further by cancelling out the w terms in the numerator and denominator therefore the efficiency of the screw jack will be equal to tan of alpha divided by tan of phi plus alpha okay so this is the efficiency of the screw jack and this formula from this formula we can see that efficiency of the screw jack is a function of only friction angle and helix angle it is independent of the load that is to be lifted okay it is only the function of the helix angle and the friction angle okay now see here this helix angle is uh, this helix angle can be a variable angle okay for different screws we can vary the helix angle but for two materials of the nut and the screw okay for the two materials of the nut and screw this friction angle will be constant okay mu is constant mu is constant for particular material of nut and screw okay which implies that tan phi or phi is constant for a particular material of a nut and screw therefore from this equation we can see that efficiency can be altered by changing helix angle for particular material of nut and screw so if you want to keep the material of the nut and screw to be same then phi will be same because it is depending upon the coefficient of friction therefore we can change the helix angle okay we can change the helix angle okay and what is the helix angle we can find out the relation of the helix angle with respect to the friction angle for the maximum efficiency okay so we want to find out the relation of the helix angle with respect to the friction angle for the maximum efficiency so now if we are interested in calculating the maximum efficiency calculation of maximum efficiency so again we can write the efficiency term again that is equal to tan of alpha divided by tan of phi plus alpha so we can write that it is equal to sin alpha by cos alpha into okay this here in the denominator can be written as sin of phi plus alpha divided by cos of phi plus alpha the cos of phi plus alpha can go into the numerator okay so this will be cos of phi plus alpha and in the denominator we will have sin of phi plus alpha and i can multiply them both with when to that is multiplying and dividing the numerator and denominator by this two okay so here we have some relations that is uh, we have some equations the trigonometric equations that is twice sin a cos b okay you can see that the numerator becomes in the form of twice sin a cos b and this twice sin a cos b it is equal to this will be equal to sin of a plus b plus sin of a minus b and there is another formula that will be in the denominator that is equal to twice cos a 
sin b so this is the formula okay this formula is equal to twice cos a sin b it is equal to sin of a plus b minus sin of a minus b okay so these are the two formula which would like to look like therefore after applying these formulae we can see that this numerator will become twice sin a cos b it is equal to sin of a plus b you can see that a is equal to alpha okay a is equal to alpha plus phi of uh, okay this b is equal to phi plus alpha therefore it will be equal to phi plus alpha plus sin of a minus b now a is equal to alpha minus b minus b means minus of phi plus alpha that is minus phi minus alpha in denominator we will have sin of a plus b okay that is equal to sin of a plus b it is again alpha plus phi plus alpha minus here sin of a minus b that is equal to alpha minus phi minus alpha okay so we can see that the numerator term will become twice alpha plus phi sin of twice alpha plus phi and sin of you can see that sine of alpha and alpha will cancel sine of minus phi will be okay sine of minus phi is equal to minus sine phi therefore this plus sign will be replaced by a negative sign here because sine of minus phi is equal to minus sine phi therefore it will be this term here divided by again in this here we will have sine of 2 alpha plus phi now alpha and alpha will cancel sine of minus phi is equal to uh, minus sine phi minus and minus will become plus sine phi okay. so this is the equation here now we can take out this term to be common efficiency will be equal to this term can be taken as common that is sine of 2 alpha plus phi this can be taken as common so in brackets we will be left with 1 minus sine phi by this term and in divide what we have again we can take sine of 2 alpha plus phi to be common and in brackets we will be left with 1 plus sine phi divided by sine of 2 alpha plus phi and we can see that this uh, numerator terms will numerator and denominator terms will cancel out we will be left with 1 minus sine phi divided by divided by 1 plus sine phi divided by sine of 2 alpha plus phi now if we carefully observe this equation we can see that this phi is constant okay phi is constant for particular materials of screw and not therefore we can't alter the sine phi term okay we can't also alter the sine phi term but we can alter the term that is sine of 2 alpha plus phi okay sine of 2 alpha plus phi so our efficiency term will be maximum when okay our efficiency term from this equation it is clear that efficiency will be maximum when sine of 2 alpha plus phi okay that is for maximum efficiency sine of 2 alpha plus phi this should be maximum because if this is maximum see here if this term is maximum then this overall term will be minimum then 1 minus minimum will be maximum similarly here if this overall ter this term is uh, maximum then this term by this term will be minimum 
and in the denominator we will have a minimum term therefore in the numerator we have maximum term and in the denominator we have we have a minimum term obviously numerator is greater than denominator therefore the efficiency will be maximum so this condition of the maximum efficiency is clear from this equation that is sine of 2 alpha plus phi should have the maximum value because its maximum value increases the denominator in increases the numerator and it decreases the denominator so again i can write that for maximum efficiency sine of 2 alpha plus phi this should be maximum and sine of 2 alpha plus phi it can have the maximum value of 1 because a sine curve fluctuates between plus 1 and maximum minus 1 maximum value is plus 1 therefore sine of 2 alpha plus phi it can have the maximum value of 1 that is equal to sine of pi by 2 so from here we can see that 2 alpha plus phi should be equal to pi by 2 2 alpha will be equal to pi by 2 minus phi alpha will be equal to pi by 4 minus phi by 2 or alpha will be equal to 45 degree okay if we are calculating in degrees this is the relation that will be used okay you can remember both of these this is the condition for or we can say that helix angle for maximum efficiency okay so n max will be We had seen a couple of slides back <coughs> that one minus sine phi so this denominator term should be one and again here this term here in this denominator should be one okay then we are left with one minus sine phi and one plus sine phi because for maximum efficiency this should be equal to one and this should also be equal to one so therefore we will be left with one minus sine phi and 1 minus 1 plus sine phi okay so this can be the maximum efficiency of the screw jack Again, there are two terms to be seen. One is the mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage, it is the ratio of load lifted to the effort applied. Okay. So we can see that mechanical advantage is equal to the ratio of the load lifted that is W to the effort applied that is equal to P. Obviously this should be quite greater than one. Okay, because the load lifted is quite large as compared to the effort applied. Okay, so this is one equation. Another term that we define is the velocity ratio This is actually defined as the distance moved by input divided by distance moved by output distance moved by the input and divided by distance moved by the output so distance moved by the input how much is the distance moved by the input again we can give so many revolutions but we can calculate it for per revolution okay if we calculate it for per revolution 
then distance moved by the input this will be equal to okay for the per revolution the distance moved by the input will be equal to uh, for one revolution the angle will be 2 pi 360 degrees or we can say that the distance moved by the input is equal to 2 pi and the distance moved by the output so in one revolution what is the distance moved by the output that is the way it is moving by a distance of lead therefore i can say that velocity ratio is equal to distance moved by the output that is equal to 2 pi divided by the distance moved by the input that is equal to the sorry distance moved by the input is equal to 2 pi and the distance moved by the output will be equal to the lead okay and we have a formula for the efficiency here that is efficiency is actually equal to mechanical advantage divided by velocity ratio so from here we can see that the mechanical advantage was equal to w by p and the velocity ratio is equal to 2 pi by lead Two pi by lead, then we can say that this will be L by two pi because velocity ratio is in the denominator. Therefore, two pi by lead, okay, lead will go up here. So it will be equal to W by p just a correction here there was actually the distance moved by the input is equal to 2 pi r not 2 pi okay because distance we have to move uh, see what is the distance therefore it is equal to 2 pi r now we make a correction here therefore since this is 2 pi r then this will be equal to pi d by l okay it will be equal to pi d by pi d by l i don't have to see what is the angle in fact i have to see what is the distance the distance will be equal to the circumference okay this distance will be equal to the circumference okay so velocity ratio will be equal to distance moved by the input that is equal to 2 pi r the distance moved by the output that is equal to the lead okay i can correct it here as well lead by 2 pi r or we can say that it is lead by pi d so again we can see that w is the load that we need to be lifted then effort applied in raising the load is equal to pi plus alpha and this l by pi d is again equal to tan alpha so this efficiency is again equal to w and w will cancel out tan alpha divided by tan of pi plus alpha so this is the same equation which we had seen while we were using the equation of okay while we were using the equation that uh, efficiency is equal to the work done by the output and divided by work done by the input we had uh, arrived at this same value of the efficiency okay this is the same value of the efficiency which we had seen sometimes the efficiency is also defined in terms of ideal effort by the actual effort this ideal effort is calculated on the basis of p ideal is calculated when no friction is there when there is no friction mu will be equal to 0 then tan of friction angle will also be equal to 0 so the ideal case will be because when the, uh, because the load the effort required to lift the load is equal to w tan of phi plus alpha when the when no friction is present then phi will be 0 therefore we will have only alpha here divided by the actual actual means when the friction is present therefore it will be equal to phi plus alpha okay or alpha plus phi therefore efficiency is again equal to tan of alpha divided by tan of phi plus alpha so these are the various ways by which we can represent the efficiency of the screw jack okay so one was the work output divided by the work input another was the in terms of the mechanical advantage and the velocity ratio and another is in terms of the 
ideal effort to the actual effort and obviously the actual effort will be greater than the ideal effort okay in the ideal conditions we we need to apply very less load therefore this term will again be equal to less than one okay so note that mechanical advantage should be greater than one velocity ratio should be greater than one and the efficiency will be less than one okay so this is all regarding the analysis of the screw jack